Um, hello everyone. I'm um, KJ, Karen Jackson. Yoda Yoda. Oh, I'll start that again because I'm not sure whether you heard me or. Um, I'm Karen Jackson, KJ, um, Yoda Yoda, and Executive Director of Mudani Balak at Victoria University. Um, and uh, Mudani Balak has a um, strong relationship with Sidran, who are hosting this webinar today. Um, I'm here to acknowledge country, so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of where I am sitting, the um, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung, um, who are counted as traditional owners in state government regulations, but I'd also like to acknowledge the Boonwurrung people as native title applicants um, across parts of this land that I'm sitting on. I'm also sitting on um, the escarpment of old land um, in my work office, you know, which is a, a white mainstream institution that uh, has, a, has a bit of work to go to, um, to work out what it wants to do around protecting country and um, caring for traditional owners. Um, but sitting in my work office, I'm also close by to thinking of the old people, um, especially the Yori Yori people who, um, who moved to Footscray um, a long time back to campaign and be advocates for Aboriginal rights. Um, and also thinking of the mob who have moved into the Western Melbourne who are still working through their own identity and belonging and how they also advocate for themselves in these spaces. Um, and Mundani Balak works closely with um, the mob in the West of Melbourne to do those things with them and alongside them. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the um, traditional owner knowledge and um, the care of country that they have taken and to recognise the footprints of, of traditional owner activity in the West of Melbourne. Um, and if you look proper when you're out and about in the West of Melbourne, you can actually see these footprints in the landscape. So, um, yeah, to finish off, I'd just like to acknowledge the Bunwurrung people and the Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of this land and um, thank them for sharing their unceded spaces with us. I'd like to hand over now to Roshani, who's going to introduce the webinar for us. Thank you. Thanks, KJ, and good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, which is the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present, as well as elders who may be present here today. I acknowledge that these are stolen lands and their sovereignty was never ceded. I'd like to welcome you all to our Sidron seminar titled Rethinking the Place, Purpose and Practice of Critical Race Scholarship. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I'd like to talk a bit about the Community Identity Displacement Research Network who organizes these seminars. Sidron is a multidisciplinary research space at Victoria University in Melbourne that fosters scholarly investigations of new diasporas and meanings of displacement and identity. It's a space where new questions about indigeneity, racism, transnationalism, sense of place, and social justice can be raised and discussed. Sidron runs these research seminars alongside scholarly work, conferences, and other events. So with that in mind, please keep an eye out for other seminars that we'll be hosting, as well as other events that we have on. Also, if anyone is interested in viewing the previous seminars that we've hosted or in presenting at one of these seminars themselves, visit our website at www.communityidentity.com.au for more information. Our presenter for today's seminar is Professor Chelsea Wadigo. Chelsea is a Mananjali and South Sea Islander woman. She is a founding board member of Inala Wangara, which is an indigenous community organization within her own community and the co-director of the Institute for Collaborative Race Research. With over 20 years of experience working within the Indigenous health space as a health worker and researcher, Chelsea's work has drawn attention to the role of race in the production of health inequalities. And we are so very lucky this afternoon to, to listen and engage in Chelsea's dialogue. Just before I hand it over to Chelsea, I'd like to inform you all that during the presentation, you'll be able to use a Q&A function at the bottom of your screens to post any questions you may have and you'll be able to thumbs up submitted questions which you'd like to be answered. After the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session moderated by Professor Chris Song, where these questions will be discussed and answered. 
General chat can also take place using the chat button at the bottom of your screens. And just a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Sidrin website. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Chelsea. Thank you, Rashani. I'm just going to um, share my screen if I can. Um, I just want to thank KJ for the acknowledgement of the country um, and echo that acknowledgement as a Mananjali and South Sea Island woman. I'm speaking today from Yagara country um, in Anala on in the outer suburbs of Mianj in Brisbane. Um, I really want to thank the organisers for inviting me here to speak today, uh, especially Chris, KJ and Paola, BU, um, uh, providing me today, I guess, a space to be in conversation about what I'm thinking in this moment about the place, purpose and practice of critical race scholarship. Um, I come, I guess, not with um, solutions necessarily, but just some things that I've been thinking about through encounters that I've had. Um, but I can't speak about the place for race scholarship without first speaking of my relationship to that place there. Because how I've come to think about race has been influenced tremendously by the relationships I've had with MOD there, um, in uh, particularly given the fierceness that is there, reflected, of course, in the most public of ways, but too has been reflected in some of the most personal and private moments. Um, I want to acknowledge that there has been a long tradition of activism and resistance that has been born out of that place. And I want to acknowledge those who I've been fortunate to think with in this current time. I remember one of my earlier trips to NAM a few years back, just a few years into my academic career, uh, hosting the Teaching Wild Black Forum. And I have to admit, I was very intimidated by those that were gathered in the room. But as people shared their stories, I was reminded that the work that we do as academics is less about what we claim to know, but how we create spaces to think out loud, to share strategies with each other, even in the sharing of our frustrations with this place. I remembered returning a while after to deliver a seminar for the Wednesday lecture, where I spoke to the uselessness of hope, to the dismay of the white folk that were there. And I was to attend a formal dinner afterwards with an all white group of academics who expressed their views quite freely. Fortunately, I had Tanine, Mariki and Nayuka turn up to that fancy dinner. And here I was reminded of the power and importance of turning up, not in a running out, uh, running one out kind of way, but rolling in together. And the joy that comes in those moments that would have been all the more violent had we turned up alone. The year before last, I had the privilege of being immersed in the writings of Ronnie Gorry and Dr. Paola Bella. Um, those texts broke me and nourished me at the very same time. I remember reading them, I think almost together and having to stop to catch my breath. I was reminded of the beauty of black writing that tells the truth about us unashamedly and the power of black stories, not the fictional ones, but the factual ones. They remind us that we are not alone, even when we're on our own. They remind us that we are not wrong, despite what this place tells us about ourselves and that we are not weak, despite what our body might feel. I've been nourished by the work and generosity of MOB here um, from there, from the readings and thinking out loud I've been able to do, from the writing style of Noka Gori, the readings that have been shared with me from Dr. Crystal McKinnon. And I guess what I'm trying to say is my thinking today is not of my own, but as a result of the conversations and thinking together with MOB. Now, what I intended to do today initially was to repurpose a public lecture I did on Ghana country last month for the Academy of Social Sciences, where I reflected on the place for critical race scholarship as a result of its marginalization and erasure in some instances. Initially, when I spoke to the Academy of Social Sciences, I argued that its place was not necessarily in the academy exclusively and that its worth should never be measured by its ability to find legitimacy there. I gave numerable examples of how and why I came to that conclusion of which I'm not going to repeat here because I think it's probably been well documented elsewhere already. In thinking about what brings this membership of Citroen uh, together, I felt I had to reframe the yarn because I'm not speaking to those who have membership inside, but those that are at the margins precisely because of the commitment to being of service to those who have been marginalised. Also, it seems a lot can happen in a month in the colony. Since that time, I've been locked up again. The same evening I delivered that public lecture on race on Ghana country, as it would turn out. Five hours on a cold cement floor, only to be released without charge, gave me far more insight into how race works than anything I've ever read. And it wasn't in the injustice of incarceration itself, but the thinking that I was forced to do precisely from that location. 
I was once again reminded um, that in um, all of my knowing legally and intellectually, I would not be protected from racial violence that ensues. And in fact, it was because of my knowing of my rights that violence was visited. I've since had another uh, invited publication for a special Indigenous issue of a journal on racial violence vetoed on a false claim of defamation risk, reminding me again that it does not matter the sophistication of our theorising, it will not guarantee that the work will find its place even when we've been invited in. But I've also been on the Writers' Festival circuit during this time, which has forced me to think about the function of writing on race and the unease with the performative nature of those public events, particularly for white audiences, where our ability to enunciate our oppression is met with applause. In reflecting on these encounters, I'm deeply uncomfortable with all of those responses, and I'm still thinking through that discomfort via today's seminar, and not in a trauma kind of way, but in a what's the point of this all kind of way. What has helped give me clarity was a more recent encounter in Nam at a Black Writers' Festival that I'd been invited to speak at. And it wasn't in what I did there, but what I witnessed and experienced from mob there. Despite having turned up alone to Nam as a guest, I was never alone. And I was met with such care from people who hadn't been afforded that same generosity at the same event I was present at. I'm talking of the young Tent Embassy, curated by Dr. Crystal McKinnon, featuring Tani Onis Williams, Smriti Onis, Spire Bella Harding, April Watson and Jermaine Charles. The embassy was convened outside of the State Library rather than inside where the other events were held. There was no sound system and no live stream despite this being touted as a modern take on the original tent embassy on the future of social justice. The revolution will not be televised it seems. Now I remember at this event which probably had the most black attendance proportionally and absolutely than other events over that weekend was the labour exhausted in the act of speaking by those who clearly had exhausted enough labour in this place. For the predominantly black audience who sat on the lawn on bean bags and mats with babies in prams, leaning on garden ledges, dodging bird good on, we had to focus hard on hearing their words that were being drowned out by the hum of the city street and some damn guitarist who just would not stop. Ironically, this session already had a program change because of a clash with the protest on that same lawn. These accommodations and indignities black fellas encounter even on one's own land was not surprising to me, but were frustrating nonetheless, in part because so much of the creative and intellectual work that had been given a microphone, a stage, seats for audience members, lighting and live streaming inside the building had benefited from the labour of those cast outside, set at the margins. It spoke to me of the extractive nature of critical race work that only gets taken up and taken inside once it's been domesticated and most made most palatable for the white audience. Yet it was this panel that offered so much theorising about the importance of black words and black lives. I remember hearing Mariki, Miss First Class Honours Onus, speak of her activism, her voice straining over the noise. But I heard her though, and I heard her speak of the reading she is doing, the thinking, the lesson she has taken, and I sat there in admiration of her humility. There was no question that her label was one of love, and I watched as she held the megaphone that someone had found for the speaker that followed, Tani Onus Williams. It spoke to me to the importance of passing the mic and making space for others, not just to bear witness, but to amplify their voice, even when ours is silenced. I remember hearing Tani and Onis Williams take it, taking us back to that day of burn it down and the events leading up to that Invasion Day protest and the events that followed and continue to haunt to this very day. I was angry that this story was not heard by others, not just those at the festival, but by those who continue to weaponize and commercialize those words without ever acknowledging the ways in which such acts continue to perpetrate violence. I remember hearing April Day speak of the loss of her mum and the work that followed, a work that didn't seek a justice or a humanizing in the way that is readily afforded white victims, but a justice that enabled structural change, changes to the law that would benefit those that followed and a humanising of her mum that wasn't tethered to her death, but through a commemoration of her birthday instead. And these lessons have then informed a strategy for helping other families navigating this very same struggle. I remember sitting beside sis Dr. Paola Bella, basking in the sun, rubbing the goosebumps off our arms as we listened to Sophia Belling Harding speak. Here she spoke publicly of things that she had not spoken of before, but in giving voice to them, regardless of who heard, shed any sense of shame that her body had carried. And when I heard her speak, I saw myself and I too saw her mom watching on. And as a black mum, I couldn't help but feel that same helplessness combined with pride when you see 
your baby stand tall in a pain that you can't prevent. It made me return to Dr. Paola Bella's PhD thesis in which she wrote of the lonely train ride home with the garbage bags of her possessions that she had managed to reclaim. And it made me think of the power of the work that we do that is not well measured by what we don't have or by the places we are welcomed into or excluded from, but about what it is we are fighting for, the things that we must cling to, and it is the things that are ours that we must claim back, not theirs. Our work and our worth is not reflected in its location, be it inside or outside of the academy or the library on the lawn or wherever, but the power of it, which is ours, even and especially when it comes from pain. It doesn't get the same awards or applause from that white audience and sometimes it doesn't even attract them. I guess because it doesn't appeal to those supposed sensibilities, but that is its power right there. This marginalised location uh, that the members of the Young Tent Embassy occupied in the excellence evidenced in their theorising and strategising response to the brutality and tragedy that is racial violence in the Congolese made me rethink the strategy of building Indigenous health humanities as a field of research. So I wonder if I can switch that yarn of how that came to be, which requires me to locate myself in relationship to that. Now, I've never had an aspiration to be an academic. I entered university at 17 with the usual first in family story. I lived in the outer suburbs of Miange and the youngest of four coming from a working poor family to a black father and white mother. We were raised to never bow our heads and to never think of ourselves as better than anyone, even if there was the odd chance that we found ourselves better off than others. We were not raised with any aspiration to transcend our material position, to move on up or secure a place inside, at the centre. Social mobility was never the measure of our worth as a people. In fact, my father being less than impressed, um, my father was less than impressed at my decision to go to university. Places like this were not meant for people like us, he said. He grew up at a time when black people didn't enter into white people's houses, where black people weren't allowed to finish high school, let alone university, at a time when racial discrimination was perfectly legal. Some might argue that his stance reflected his limited imagination, imaginings of the capabilities of black fellas, of his failure to have moved with the times. I would argue it was an insight into these places that I should have taken more heed of. I was trained to be an Aboriginal health worker in a three year bachelor degree program at UQ in the late nineties. And my desire to do this course was that it was a vehicle for which I thought I could get tools for working for my community, not to be better off individually and materially, but collectively. I did a PhD not to be an academic, but to tell a story that I felt needed telling that spoke back against the violent texts about us that I had been trained to accept as fact. Upon graduating, I did not seek out an academic appointment. I ran play groups in my community. It would take over two decades working in Indigenous health that I'd be appointed within the discipline that I was trained, to which I was appointed Professor of Indigenous Health within QUT School of Public Health and Social Work last year. Now, I don't see such a location as a mountaintop moment deserving of applause. In fact, it's one that I struggle with at times while also being one that has arrived through struggle. Some might say that intellectually I came to race fairly late in the context of my career, and on the one hand that is true, to the extent that my undergraduate training of three years or five days a week didn't teach us about it. But in a small classroom of about 15 students, most of which were mob, we did think about race. It was just a knowing that we would never be assessed against inside the classroom. Such theorising was left to the smoke breaks between lectures and tutorials, again, outside on the lawn. I remember as a 17 year old watching this knowing being contested on the daily, particularly among the more senior Indigenous people in the classroom, contesting the accounts of us, not through their supposed newly acquired intellectual tools, but because of their embodied knowledge. I remember feeling strong when they did it, which contrasted with that sick feeling that comes with being assessed on my ability to speak of myself in a way that was disconnected from what I knew of my social world an account that offered the most narrow window into our world that never did justice to the lives we live in its fullest sense. What I learned about race, not as part of the curriculum, but in my being with other black fellas in that room each day was the knowledge and power of black fellas. And it was found amongst the most senior people who were deemed least educated in the Western sense, who are presumed to be most in need of pastoral care and extra tutoring. That stubborn sense of sovereignty could, could just not be disciplined out of them. And as such, they were my most influential educators. They taught me about the reality of race, but it was in their being that I was reminded of our power in the moments when they expect the least of you. It was in this black intellectual collective that a most sophisticated and intimate understanding of race would emerge, despite their best efforts to discipline it out of us. 
and despite our lack of disciplinary training and critical race theory. It was this grounding over 20 years ago that would inspire the building of Indigenous health humanities as a new field of research. I wanted to recreate the learning environment I had been blessed with. Last year, my team and I were awarded, awarded a $1.7 million research grant to do this. Indigenous health humanities inspired by Professor Rigney's Indigenous research principles and informed by values expressed in the Inala Manifesto, it seeks to build an intellectual collective that is committed to the survival of Indigenous peoples locally and globally and foregrounds Indigenous intellectual sovereignty. Rather than uphold the disciplines we were disciplined in or the institutions that employ us, it seeks to bring various knowledges to the table to think collectively and to fight courageously. Yet even what I thought even with what I thought was an entry ticket in to carve out this space, I found myself cast out literally because there was not even an office to house me or my team in or boxes or a trolley available to move myself out. But just like the mob the other week who found the megaphone, I ended up finding an office for us to work from. Now there are a range of what we call streams which are part of the foundation from which we're building this field. One that I've been particularly interested in exploring is Indigenous critical race theory which takes seriously the intersection of race, indigeneity and sovereignty in the global south. This work has been undertaken with Dr. David Singh, our academic director, in which we are critically examining the purpose of race scholarship beyond a purely theoretical framework to include a framing of eth an ethics of anti-racist practice that foregrounds indigenous sovereignty. What we are trying to do here is to think of indigeneity not as a variation to being human, but as foundational and in doing so illuminate understandings of what it is to be uniquely and fully human in relation to the natural and ancestral world. This work seeks to forge a black humanity explored and defined by black fellows, challenging received notions of liberation and the traditional role of race in animating liberation struggles. This, it also offers a deeper understanding and delineation of how black fellows have imbued meaning to race. It seeks development of a critical mass of Blackfellow race scholars that brings Blackfellows, Black communities and victims of racial violence together in company and righteous rage. It seeks the creation of spaces culturally, intellectually, politically and legally for those negatively racialized to speak freely about race and how it makes and breaks them, but also to strategize how to make the perpetrators of racial violence pay in whatever way we can. Now, in the course of this work, I've had any number of critical race scholars in this place, emerging and eminent, insist that I am not one, who've reduced my scholarly contributions to that which they read on Twitter and the op-eds I've authored, none of which captures the actual work I do, but the erasure of intellectual labour of blackfellas is nothing new in this place, so I haven't lost any sleep over it. But in reflecting on these critiques, I'm actually okay with not meeting the criteria of being a critical race scholar, precisely because of the parameters they've set. I'm not well read or well disciplined, and I feel very privileged to have a day job that enables me to think. And I've never for a second thought that this position was one in which I could claim to know at the expense of all others. So I'm most thankful for the shade those critical race scholars have thrown my way because it too has crystallized for me the work I do, who I do it for, and why. So to them, I say thank you. It is knowing that places like this are meant for people like us that I'm okay with being cast out of the category of critical race scholarship, particularly if it means adhering to the rules of the very institution that has long brutalized us in its exclusion and inclusion. I'm now less interested in arguing about what constitutes critical race theory or fighting with settlers for recognition of its legitimacy within their institutions. Our power, the power of our work is not found in their recognition, but in the fights that we take up, the battlegrounds of our choosing. So today I wanna to speak less of an indigenous critical race theory and instead speak to indigenous critical race wars. Wars that have been fought long before our time and certainly before we got our PhDs, our publications, research grants and those theories. I refer here to the black wars of South Queensland during the 1840s to 1860s. Ray Kirchhoff notes that mob annihilated livestock, not for sustenance, but to divest squatters of food and income. Food stores too was not simply pilfered for a ready meal, they were emptied. And mob cut off pathways such as creek crossings and mountain passes from Mount Gravatt in Brisbane to Cunningham's Gap, forcing settlers to run the gauntlet of their spears. With mailmen between Strutty and Brisbane slain as a means of intercepting communications. What was particularly illuminating for me in looking to the Southern Queensland Black Wall was the evidence of intertribal alliances made apparent by the attacks that would be launched following the triennial Bunyanut gathering 
which would bring mob from all across southeast Queensland to gather for months at a time. It was here where each tribe would tell the others what happened in their part of the country and, of course, strategize. Settlers were surprised at the courage of black fellas in standing up and facing the white man's gun. Leichhardt observed, the black with his weapon is no coward. Calmly, he meets his enemies. At Breakfast Creek, black fellas taunted the police and others were described as having prowled about at unseemly hours to frighten Brisbane citizens and dance on settlers' graves. During an invasion on the Darling Downs, it was observed that the killing of a horse would be counted by them as a great victory. The tail being taken as a trophy would be whisked in the first white man's face they met. Naturally, it's in this tradition I wish to follow, not those who are appealing to the academy deemed worthy of. I draw on the writings of the late Professor Walter Rodney and specifically the groundings of my brothers in which he reflects upon the decision of the Jamaican government to ban him having attended a Black Writers Festival in Montreal in 1968, leaving him not just jobless but stateless. It was in this place of exile, much like the Blacks of South Queensland and those on city streets in Nam, that he offered what I think is a useful and insightful strategy for waging war against race. So I kind of want to reflect today on this in a way that doesn't foreclose what constitutes doing the work, but explores the tensions and possibilities in the very varying battlegrounds that we are fighting on. Rodney reminds us that central to our concerns must be cause rather than career. And I'm conscious that I say that as someone who has managed to carve out a career in the academy. But it was in my decision to walk away from the race and sex discrimination case against UQ last year and a tenured academic position at a sandstone that this was tested and affirmed for me. The decision came about because it felt shame for me to waste any more labour over fighting to get a seat at their table. The war on race is not a matter of whether one of us gets in, whether one of us gets that job or even keeps it. I think we have to choose our battles wisely because there are so many and I don't think it should be those wage that only generate individual and financial gain. The fight isn't over the workplace, but rather constantly finding ways to do the work that we're meant to be doing, which is meant to be of service to mob. The measure of my work as a scholar is not evidenced by my H index, but in the things that have been built, most of which don't get counted in promotion committee deliberations. And the work I'm most proud of, if I can say that, is the things that have been built that forge spaces for others to do the work that is needed whether it's an NGO in my community or a race research institute. It's not separate from my scholarship. It shapes my thinking, tests my values and ethics daily and informs the scholarly work that I choose to undertake. We cannot assume though that all of those who come to race share these values. Some may for a moment in their particular racial encounter of being cast out or cast aside, who then when that time has passed for them will cut and run back to the center. This is meant for me being very deliberate about around who I work with and giving as much, if not more thought to the values that shape their work, not just that which they claim to know. Rodney insists that the black intellectual must move beyond his own discipline and attach himself to the activity of the black masses. When I reflect on my own life, my understanding of race has come from black people. And I don't buy the idea that as black fellows, all we have to offer is an account or an experience of racism. It is in these experiences that all manner of theorizing and strategizing takes place, and it does not require a PhD to do so. The best race theorists sit in our homes and our communities. They are the same people that the academy has fought so desperately to discipline us to think disparagingly about. Critical race theorizing is taking place in all kinds of locations by all kinds of black fellas, and these intellectual collectives we build must be far broader than our, than our colleagues up the hall or the elite clubs we've been granted entry into in our supposed knowingness. We need to be in conversation with each other, not to bring our tools as scholars to community, but to see all of us as capable of knowing something about race in this place and sharing the commitment to doing something about it. In attaching oneself to the activity of the black masses, we have to be cautious about the extractive nature of our work as academics. The race scholar has no special right to black stories, and this space is as exploitative and extractive as any other place. And there are rules that should govern this work not rules about what constitutes scholarship writ large, what it is to foreground Indigenous humanity and sovereignty all at once, not just as your argument, but in the processes by which you make it. Claiming black testimony while erasing black theory is a form of violence. Critical race scholarship must be a place that first and foremost is of service to the struggle and not divorced from it via a better knowing of it. 
We have to interrogate the ways in which we learn from each other and importantly, how is that work of better service to collective action rather than scholarly standing? Rodney reminds us of the importance of humility in our work. This is not a place for egos, but most certainly a place for mistakes to be made, so long as we're prepared to own them. This work is hard and our knowing doesn't protect us against it. The power of race is that it's constantly transforming, constantly finding ways to cement itself in place. We are bound to not get it right and not get the wins, even if we get it right intellectually. Critical race scholarship is a place that demands a certain humility and that comes more easily to those connected to our communities because we have no choice but to be humble. Mob will make sure you are as a gift of love, not of lateral violence. But to receive that gift demands a relinquishment of that racist belief that black people are inferior and undeserving or better or of insisting upon more. It means relinquishing the idea that black people are incapable of knowing because they haven't read as closely as you the texts you've decided that are worthy of being read. It was also for this reason too that I took time out from social media um, early this year, not as a retreat from the fight, but as a regrounding in it. The work didn't stop. In fact, during this time, I've had to reckon with work that was most violent, but it helped me check myself in terms of who and what was most important and who was most deserving of my time and where my labor was best exhausted. It also made me think about the limitations of the work I had been involved in, much of which, which came about via black deaths. There has been a lingering unease for me in that much of the work I've done in relation to race had arrived too late when loved ones were already lost. It forced me to think, uh, think that black deaths cannot be the sole means by which we are galvanized to act on racial violence. We have to attend to it in life and in death, in custody and in the colony. I know too many black fellows who are fighting to live in this moment and our work must be bound up in a love for the living too. Rod reminds us that beauty is in the very existence of our people after all. We must think of this work as a war and those that can't obviously have not known it, of it at their kitchen table. If race is but only an intellectual curiosity for which you come up with the most sophisticated articulation of it, then we have no need for you in this fight. The complicity, the solidarity with white supremacy is strong in this place, but no stronger than the unceded sovereignty of black fellows in this place. And when I say unceded sovereignty, I don't mean every black fellow in this place. I speak specifically to those whose sense of worth, either as a black fellow or as a scholar, is not bound up in inclusion in their spaces. The refusal or rejection of these locations is not anti-intellectual. It is pro-black, pro-Indigenous, and the fact that some see this as mutually exclusive speaks to their limited racialized imaginings. To think of this work as one of war is to know of it as ongoing and unrelenting. And this can be hard, haunting almost, and most definitely tiring, especially when the supposed wins are few and far between. And even mar when marginalization will always be our location. Some will cling to hope and the false promise of progress what I think holds us is the values that we hold ourselves and each other to. And it is these values rather than those theories that we all must continue to grapple with and share with each other. And I guess that's what I've tried to do today in sharing these stories is not to give solutions, but to use this seminar to create a space for which we can have a conversation collectively about what those values should be.